Exactly. All right, I show the time as 6.30, so we'll call ourselves to order. If you'd join me in the Pledge of the Allegiance. Thank you. Roll call, please. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, yes, Jeff Baker, here. Elise Jones, here. David Beacon, here. Randy Wheelock, here. Chrissy Fanganello, Anthony Graves, here. Robin Kanich, here. Roger Partridge, here. Gail Watson, Libby Zabo, here. Bob Pfeiffer, here. Bob Roth, here. Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, here. Ann Justin, no. here. Lynn Baca, here. Tara Radloff, Jeff Blue, George Teal, Jason Bauer, here. Doris Trular, here. Laura Christman, Earl Holan, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, here. Scott Norquist, here. Saoirse Karras Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, here. Shakti, here. Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Phil Cernanek, present, Jason Lofgren, Wynn Shaw. Present. Joan Peck. Gabe Santos. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Here. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Kyle Mullica. Here. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Gary Howard. Rita Dozal. Here. Heidi Williams. Eric Montoya. Herb Atchison. Joyce J. Here. Adam Zarin. Deborah Perkins Smith. Here. Bill Van Meter. Here. And we have a quorum. Thank you. We do have a quorum. So we do have one uh, new member to introduce this evening, the town of Lock Bowie. Their alternate is Larry Strock, trustee. And with us this evening is their mayor pro tem, uh, Jacob Lofgren. Jacob? And uh, Mr. Chairman, is is he aware of the hazing procedure? Uh, we'll, that's a uh, that's in the parking lot later. <laughs> Move to approve the agenda. I'll entertain a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the agenda? All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions. Report of the chair, um, we have three items as you can see. The report on RTC, um, RTC is basically part of the agenda tonight. We had uh, two items that we went into some detail on and they are informational brief briefings, item 11 and 12. So I won't go into any detail because we'll have presentations on both of them this evening. Uh, report on performance and engagement. Where is he? Mr. Pfeiffer. Um, we didn't meet this, this month. Sorry, we didn't meet this month, but we'll go ahead and, uh, Herb, if you have any updates for the um, look, uh, the executive director, um, Hunt. Couldn't think of the words. Okay. Just uh, short of an update, uh, we are still collecting uh, applications. We do have a rather extensive group of applicants. Those are being pre-screened by EFL. The P&E committee, you will be receiving your packets at the retreat that will have all the bios and stuff of those who have been screened and made it to the under consideration piece. So I know that we have, as I recall, the entire P&E committee is committed 
at the retreat. May I ask how many members F and B are going, Mr. Chairman? Oh. Uh, Ooh. I am. I'm here. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> wow. As you, just please note that he's not the chair of the PNE. He's just talking a lot of. <laughs> He's the he's the chair of the sub he's subcommittee. He's the want to be chair. Of the <laughs> but we do appreciate some of his competitive spirit. <laughs> All right. Next, we have the report on finance and budget. Director Dyack, please. Wow. Thank. Follow you. that up. Uh, I don't think I can. I don't really have uh, that routine down with any of my other directors. I we need to work on that next month, I guess. Uh, we, we had a, a fairly brief uh, agenda. Uh, we approved authorization for executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with CDOT uh, for transportation planning funds to fund objectives, activities, and tasks for 2018-2019 in the Unified Planning Work Program, otherwise known as UPWOOP. Love to say UPWOOP. Uh, second agenda uh, item was uh, the uh, continuing saga of looking for office space for Dr. Cog going forward. Uh, do they anticipate a growth? Uh, we had a little bit of an addition uh, to our search. Uh, we added an additional building, and with that, I will ask uh, Sam DePiesel, uh to give us an update on the latest on our office space search. Sam. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everybody. Sam DePiesel, CVRE, the real estate broker for those that weren't here uh, last month. Uh, there was an addition. Uh, it was something that was on our radar screen previously. We had actually brought Roxy through uh, six months ago to look at the building. It's 1001 17th Street. It's the old Mountain Bell building off 17th and Arapahoe, essentially. It fits our needs really it's really the front runner at this point there's it's almost a 33,000 foot floor plate which would give us contiguous growth of expansion on one floor which of course is a real benefit the second thing is is the bay depths are deeper so we're primarily open plan so we should lay in more efficiently the third thing is it's got better parking um, not in terms of ratios but in terms of functionality handicap access to boardrooms a lot of the things which are really critical to Dr. Cog's functionality with their meetings. And I think the most important thing is the boardroom. Um, one of the, we've been looking at common conference facilities at 1700 Lincoln and 1225, which were the previously two shortlisted options. They were both windowless and they had varying degrees of problems. I mean, 1225, we'd have to build out, uh, take over the management office and build out a better functioning large boardroom. 1700 Lincoln, there was an issue of column spacing. This is column free with windows. So that's the other kind of critical point to 1001. Uh, it's, we haven't fully flushed it out right now. We're planning out our, our needs in that space. And we should be in a position to give you a more detailed report uh, next two to four weeks. Great. And with that, I'd open it up to any questions. Sir. Sure. Uh, you've talked about the amenities and the physical layout. Um, Maybe with the committee, you could comment on the financial side of it that we received at least a high level sure. understanding for the other two options. So at a high level, it's very competitive with the other two options. One of the variables right now with the financial analysis is how much square footage we ultimately take. Um, we're, we're planning into 21,000 feet and change at 1225. We're planning into 24,000 feet and change at 1700 Lincoln. And because this is a almost a 33,000 foot plate, and we don't have the plan yet back, we don't have that square footage. But but it should be depending. If you looked at it on a pure apples to apples basis, slightly less expensive than the other options we're considering. Um, but again, that's subject to kind of the final determination on how much square footage we're taking. Other questions or comments, Mr. Rex. Mr. Chairman, real quick. Um, Related to that, yeah, I think we're going to cost it out for the full 33,000, the full floor template, as well as 24, 25 ish, because we feel that's kind of the sweet spot for us around that amount and uh, see what both of those look like. Um, but I will tell you, I've been through the building a couple times now, and I took senior staff through as well, and I, it was unanimous that this, this building location had it, what we needed, um, and I Quite frankly, it just felt right. It was one of those that we felt is by far the, the, fr the front front runner. It had, as Sam, as Sam suggested, the conference space was 
far superior than the other two. Um, so we feel very comfortable where we are going forth. And I think the Finance and Budget Committee does too. They've, they've at least given us direction to, con to continue to pursue it. Yeah, uh, the, the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, very comfortable. We, uh, we had a uh, tour of the first two buildings uh, through the discussion uh, with the third, with the information brought forward. Uh, we felt very comfortable that this uh, was probably the best, uh, the best course of action. We're relying heavily on staff and, and their recommendation. Uh, not to mention the, um, everything that we've got in terms of uh, uh, blueprints of, uh, of plates, of the, of the floor plates. Uh, but you know, to us, I think next steps is we have the ability to independently uh, walk through. Uh, we chose not to, to do a group uh, a group review of the third building, uh, but we can go and take a look at this. Uh, Director uh, Executive Director Rex has indicated we can just make a um, appointment with him if anybody else wants to do that. More than happy to, but based up on what we've heard in the committee discussion, uh, we feel very comfortable with them moving forward on this. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Thanks, Director Dyack. We'll move on to agenda item six. And thank you, Sam. We'll move on to agenda item six, report of the executive director. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few items this evening. First, uh, upcoming events, the 27 board workshop. I'm sure you've been littered with emails about this, and I hope everybody had an opportunity to sign up for it. However, I will say that if you st still haven't signed up, you're more than welcome to make the journey down in the springs on Saturday morning, and uh, that's because that's really the meat of the, of the, of the workshop is on, on Saturday. So we would encourage you to do so if you had a change in plans and all of a sudden you can make it. Uh, please, we, we'd love to have you. Um, I would like to remind everybody, we also sent e uh, some emails out to you all about this, uh, this concept of creating a poster, kind of highlight two or three uh, uh, items that you're obviously proud of within your community. And um, we have received quite a few. Uh, I think we're up around 10 right now, and I know of at least three others that are on its way. Uh, we had a, a deadline of Friday for those. But if you just keep it amongst yourself, I heard, you know, Monday or Tuesday would be all right, too. So, um, so yes, it's just, so please, just get them in. And they, they've been great. I must say, you guys, you guys have done some great work on these. So we, we really just, do appreciate it. Just between it. the three or four of us. Just. <laughs> That's right. Um, all righty. The uh, next item, and you have handouts in front of you tonight. Um, the uh, Metro Vision Idea Exchange, exchange uh, will be held here on Friday, September 8th. That's our next upcoming one. Um, it will focus on collaborative efforts between community-based nonprofits and local governments to improve access to opportunity. Um, the session will include some great models from, from Minneapolis-St. Paul region as well as some innovative efforts in our own region. So please, these are re they're really well attended. I think you will garner a lot of information from this. And please share this with your staffs as well. Um, I think they would re really appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss some of these items. Um, you also see a handout um, for an event that's on September 20th. And by the way, that's my birthday, so Mr. Chairman, you may want to plan accordingly. <laughs> um, that I hope you will strongly consider. It's the uh, 2017 Ra Rail, Volu Rail Volution. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great event. It's, it's been going on for 20 years or so now. And uh, we hosted this back in, back in 2000, I believe. Um, so it's come back around again. This is a tremendous event. Uh, so we wish you would at least consider this. But on the last day of the conference, what I really wanted to draw your attention to, on the last day of the conference, Dr. Cog has been working with RTD and many of the other partners for this to host a special session uh, to, to both celebrate our successes but more importantly discuss what might be, what might be next in mobility for this region. Um, where we, we, it used to be called Local Day, that's what it's typically called these rail, rail, I can't say rail evolution, uh, events, um, but we changed the name this year and we're calling it Regional Day. And, um, um, and it will include, you will feature perspectives, um, and experiences from national and local thought leaders, including our very own Elise Jones, will be on a, on a panel. Uh, Chrissy Fanganello will be on a panel. And our very own Brad Calvert will also be on a panel. So, um, so please. Oh, and the other part of that, probably the most important part, is the uh, registration for that. It, there's, there's a cost associated with this $20 registration fee. We're willing to, because we feel so important about this event, and we'd like as many as possible to attend this 
that we will, we will absorb that cost, Dr. Cog will. So if you, would, if you are interested in attending this, you or your alternate, and um, uh, please just reach out to Connie and let her know, and we'll get a name on, and we'll do a group reservation for that. Um, so please consider that. I, I really do think it will be a good event. Baghdad-Denver Regional Partnership. You received emails about this as well. We'll be hosting uh, participants of the Iraqi Youth Leaders Exchange Program on Monday, August 21st at 10 o'clock in this room, um, and it will include lunch. Um, so if you're interested, please contact uh, Connie, and we anticipate that the participants will explore a number of topics related to civic events, such as leadership development and community engagement and stuff like that. So please, if you're, if you're able to attend that, um, we, would, we would certainly welcome you. Mr. Hicks, hold on one second. Yes. It will also include eclipse viewing. Wow. <laughs> is that the day? It is. With, with legitimate <laughs> lenses? <laughs> yeah, right. We'll put it on the screen. <laughs> Um, in your packets this evening, attachment F, I just wanted to draw your attention to this, is in the informational items, um, is the 2016 annual report on executive policies. Uh, the report is produced annually to ensure uh, the advancement of board goals and policies are being conducted by the executive director and staff in a legal and ethical and prudent manner. So we just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Um, I will report that there, we, the report indicates there are no violations of, of such in 2016. Um, if you have any questions related to this, please contact Jerry Stiegel. He's, he's, the, he's the main poobah associated with that, with that report. Uh, let me see here. Some good news. Um, Dr. Cog's Way to Go program was honored by the Association of Commuter Transportation, or ACT, at their annual event last month in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, uh, they, we received uh, an award for um, the Best Commuting Options Campaign for our school pool program. Um, and which has really become a, a national model of success for us. More than 19,000 families are enrolled in this program within this region, so I would really like to congratulate Mia, uh, Mia Bemelin and uh, Steve Erickson from our, from our uh, Way to Go program, as well as the entire crew, because this is a pretty big deal. Um, I will say that we also had another finalist in, in, the, uh, in the award section of this for our um, Way to Go Go-tober event. So we had a couple in the final, but this one was selected for, for an award. So thank you, Steve, and, and me, and everybody. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, several months ago, we talked to you about a new grant that we, we were uh, awarded with. It's called the Accountable Health Communities Grant. It's a $4.5 million grant through, through, uh, through CMS. And um, we're in the process right now, Jerry Stiegel actually is working with the AHC Advisory Board to develop a strategic plan and scorecard um, that will cascade down to all participating members. And all, just so you know, I mean, this, this is pretty cool stuff because, you know, we've taken on this scorecard approach, balanced scorecard approach for some time now, last couple of years or so. All the 15 organizations that are involved with this grant, there's three clinical, three behavioral health, and nine community service organizations will all be adopting scorecards to improve some of their operational flows as part of this, this grant. So that's all pretty cool stuff, and it all aligns with Dr. Cog's uh, scorecard and the like, too. So it's, it's pretty neat that this seems all to be coming together. All, that, all those meetings with Jerry through the last couple, three years seem to be coming to fruition. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Mr. Chairman, that is my report. Questions or comments of the Executive Director? Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item seven, which is public comment. Up to 45 minutes is going to be allotted for public comment. We allow each speaker three minutes. Uh, if there are additional requests beyond the 45-minute allotment, we will allow opportunity at the end of the meeting. We do request that there be no public comment for uh, item that there has been a previous public hearing. And our consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Sir, the next three minutes are yours. My name is Randall Loeb. I'd wish I could have the 45. <laughs> Ending Homelessness is the title of a book written by Donald Burns. It's published in 2016. He gave me a personal copy. Uh, I really uh, like present data when I'm talking about this subject, and this book has all of it. It has some of the national leaders, Martha Burt, uh, Samson Barris, many of the colleagues I've worked with over the course of my lifetime. I was in uh, Philadelphia 
uh, working with people in my grandfather's hospital where it was uh, poor people who lived on the skids in the area where I grew up. Uh, I was actually in a suburb, but that's where my grandfather had his office. And I fed people in the wards and took them to places as a child of 15. I later had the opportunity as a peer worker to work in Covenant House in New York City when I worked on my first graduate degree in guidance and counseling. Later in my life, I found myself on the street. Uh, I have bipolar disease that has affected me all the time I've been alive. The first chapter of this book has an account of a woman who's African American and her struggles and her a feeling of shame and in being invisible is the first sentence of her work and it's very uh, compelling. I would urge you all, I've, heard, I've, I've advised you many times on other things, to have a reverse panel of a number of us to talk to you at one of your uh, Metro Vision things on wh what it really is like to live in extreme poverty in the Metro region and have representatives from different counties who would be able to answer questions. Now reverse panels are nothing new. I've done them actually in the state many times before as a p member of the Interagency Council on Homelessness. And I really feel that we are not really understanding how compelling it is for you all and every constituent of yours to be impacted by us and our experience. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda com consists basically of the minutes of the July 19th meeting. Any uh, changes or discussion on the agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. And abstentions. Very good. We will move on to agenda item nine, which is attachment B, and turn it over to Mr. Cottrell. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Mr. Chair. So before you, attachment B, are three amendments to the 1821 tip for your consideration this evening. Uh, the first is an amendment to the C-470 managed toll express lanes. So since TIFIA closed a couple of months ago, uh, there is now a need to adjust um, this TIP project to reflect the final, final financing package. There are several actions that are associated with this amendment, and these include adjusting the TIFIA loan to the final amount. Um, the second is removing $52 million in ramp funding, so that only $48 million is shown in the project, though most of that is shown within the prior funding column. Um, and so in regards to this ramp funding reduction, attachment two contains letters from both HPTE and the C-470 uh, Corridor Coalition Steering Committee um, out outlining additional details. Uh, one of the, the third action is an increase in the bonds and loan funding. Uh, and finally, CDOT is asking to add two additional state funding sources. The second project for your consideration is a new project from C-470 to Wadsworth to I-70. Uh, this is a new project um, for study and pre-construction activities for a future C-470 expansion. Uh, this is funded with $19 million in ramp funding. Uh, and this $19 million in ramp funding is um, a part of the $52 million in ramp savings from the previous C-470 project. The third is an amendment to the I-25 South PEL project. Um, this would add $15 million in ramp funding for NEPA uh, activities for that gap section between Castle Rock and Monument. Um, and just also to note that this ramp funding that's being added uh, is not associated with the $52 million in savings from the C-470 project. It's totally separate. So those are the three amendments before you, and I'll happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Questions or comments? Yes. Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in a way, you might call this Douglas County night because you see all these projects there. It, there is a, a major project in Jefferson County. I would just like to comment, certainly uh, thank you for the presentation. and. 
and staff putting this all together, but uh, this certainly came at a lot of effort and a lot of cooperation. And really, I, I just want to commend CDOT for the work, the transportation work that they've done, and the coalition partners, because it was a challenge all the way around, as we all know. And I just want to note, we forgot to put Dr. Cog's uh, portion on here. No, actually, because there is no Dr. Cog money. It's just because of the way this this did come about, there was no Dr. Cog funding. But this is a, this shows how fast major projects can get done when there's a cooperation. So I just would uh, certainly uh, commend everyone who was involved, and I would move that we move forward with this second motion. We have a motion and a second to approve the attached amendments to the 2018-2021 TIP. Discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Very good. Thank you. The next item we have is agenda item 10, which is under attachment C, and it's the TIP set-asides, and we'll turn it over to Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everybody. Uh, you have before you this evening uh, consideration of the set-asides for the uh, 2020 to 2023 TIP. This was a topic of discussion at our uh, most recent work session where you, uh, you kind of got a straw vote or head nod to bring this forth for consideration to, for you all tonight. But at part of that, you wanted some additional information about the existing set-asides, about what they were, and. Uh, you know some of the benefits associated with so we provided that in your packet this evening I hope it's satisfactory to you all um, I uh, uh, first I guess I will let me grab my agenda there's uh, there's text that provide on uh, attachment one that provides a summary of those of this of this set asides as plus the these are basically the existing set asides plus the um, um, no, sorry, the, the new one that we're suggesting, the human services, human service transportation set aside is included within the packet, the agenda item itself. So I wanted to alert that to you. Um, but before I begin, and I'm just going to step through some of the existing and then talk about the proposed. Um, before I begin, though, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page, and because I, I know there's a lot of new faces that, um, that weren't part of the, uh, the TIP process last time, I can tell because I, you have no visual scars. So I know which ones you are. Uh, if anybody who's been through that process knows what I'm talking about. But it's uh, what, 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 do you, um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, so what we're talking about here this evening, you know, before we ever get to the point of doing a call for projects, um, which you can see is right here in the middle of the screen. I don't know if my cursor's moving here or not. Right here in the middle of the screen, what we historically, the board has decided to do is to set aside some monies for these long-standing programs that, quite frankly, in, you know, it was $40 million that was set aside last time. Um, and these projects, the majority of the money gets put back out into the communities, typically in a separate call for projects. Um, and that's true for, there's calls for every single one of those, at least components of, of, uh, of every single one of those. So, um, so that, that is, this is what we're going to be talking about here tonight, this set-aside program right here. Okay, so real quick, what I'm planning on doing, I asked each, each, um, each staff member that was responsible for, the, for each, you know, these set-asides independently to give me a couple slides to kind of describe exactly what these are. So I'm just going to step through real quick. Some of this you, you guys already know, but um, the first one is the Station Area Master Planning Urban Center Studies, our STAMP and UC, UC uh, uh, set-aside. And these funds are used for local governments and other local entities um, such as our transportation management agency partners and the like um, to um, in efforts to develop plans and implementation strategies around stations, uh, ra our rapid transit stations within our communities as well as our designated urban centers, the regionally designated urban centers. Um, and you know over the last 10 years, as you can see on the slide, we've, we've funded 43 studies um, to the tune of uh, just over six point three million dollars, and I can tell you, you know, just the, the, just to speak to the importance of these studies and what it means. Between 2010 and 2015, nearly 50 percent 
of the new jobs within our region were within one mile of an existing or planned rapid transit station, and nearly one third of all new housing units were around these uh, these um, uh, rapid transit stations. So, obviously, it makes tremendous sense to begin to, uh, uh, to provide uh, funding for for um, uh, very important studies around around these these two um, these two items being urban centers and, and uh, station areas. Just to give you an example of the types of projects that we're talking about, this is in the town of Englewood. The original study was done in 2013, and it really focused on development guidelines for unified um, quality development around multiple stations along, along the uh, Southeast Corridor, uh, Southeast Rail Corridor. And then later on, um, in 2015, and we fund these as well, you know, it's kind of the next step study, what we refer to them as, is as they get closer to implementation. And what they did in the 2015 study, they worked with the town of Sheridan to, um, uh, to come together and coordinate their efforts along that corridor. And those studies are both uh, published on, on their website, and, and I'm sure Mayor Jefferson is, is very aware of these studies. But it's just, it, it's just a, an example of the type of work that we do in the area of, of STAMP and, and UC studies. And one quick correction, it's the Southwest Corridor. Oh, I'm so sorry. Southwest Corridor, indeed. Yep. Thank you very much. Regional TDM program, a regional traffic, the transportation demand management program. Um, these funds are established uh, to assist local governments and our T TMAs and others uh, to implement strategies that reduce single occupancy vehicle travel and ultimately contribute to uh, the improvement of air quality and congestion reduction. Um, it started back in 1999. I mean, a lot of these programs have been around a long time. The STAMP program is no exception. That's been around quite a bit of time as well. Um, and it's really, uh, in, there's really two parts to this, right? There's the, there's the pool part where we do a call for projects every two years. Um, to allocate monies based on the criteria that you guys all established. And we're getting ready to do a call for projects right now. With, between now and the end of the year, we will be doing another call. Um, and uh, the other part of that is the TDM partnerships. Um, I'd just like to speak to that real quickly. One of the things, I've been, in, I've been here almost four years now, and one of the things I marveled at when I first came was, uh, was this program. Um, this is very innovative. This is, there's not many places around the country that have this established. And we, we get phone calls all the time about how we establish this, willing, whether we're willing to share our MOU that we have with our TM, TMA partners. Um, because it's a, tremendous, it, it just, it just, it's a tremendous collaborative that really works. And I'll talk about the, about the TDM partnership a little bit here in, um, with regards to you know, what the responsibilities of Dr. Cog and our TMA partners are. But I just wanted to, you know, give them a little shout out that this is this tremendous work they do and the outreach they do to the, our business community is, uh, is uh, very beneficial for our air quality issues. Um, as far as the, uh, the the benefits of the TDM program, uh, we've selected over 61 projects over the last three calls for for projects. Um, we're currently, you know, in, under the implementation right now for the for the latest call. Um, but you can see just up on the screen exactly what we're looking at with regards to, to vehicle miles travel reduction, 13.2 um, million in the, in the 2012-13 cycle, and you can read it as well as I can. But it's, it's, it's a program that has shown results and benefits on the air quality side, and um, we would encourage you strongly to continue to fund this program. Um, Way to Go. Way to Go program is a, is a regional brand. Uh, it is primarily administered through, uh, through Dr. Cog's staff and Steve Erickson's crew in the communications and marketing uh, section. Um, we, uh, um, it's really, you know, we, we consider it a very, it's a national model. We've been recognized, as you heard tonight, with regards to our school pool program and other things, that it's well respected nationally. Um, uh, and uh, like I said, we, we get calls all the time about, about the partnership itself. But just in regards to the roles, um, within the partnership, Dr. Cog really does, you know, kind of the regional advertising and promotion of it, the school pool program or carpool program and those types of things. Um, and we do outreach outside of the transportation management agency uh, boundaries. Um, and then the role of the TMA partners themselves, they have established boundaries. And Steve, Steve Erickson gave a presentation on this not that long ago, so I won't belabor the point. But they do a tremendous job in reaching out to the employers within their districts um, to basically explain to them that there are options re uh, 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 separate from, you know, single occupancy vehicles. 
and uh, they do a good job of explaining that to them and, and coordinating their efforts and, and, uh, and helping them and assisting them as much as possible. <clears throat> So, so what does Way to Go really do? It really promotes commuter choice, and you name it: carpool, vanpool, transit, biking, walking, all the above. Um, you know, we we promote. So it's basically anything but driving alone. And, and we have we have we have been able to demonstrate significant BMT and, and SOV reductions. And I'll show you a slide here now that here in a second that that uh, that, ba that definitely uh, um, illustrates that. Let me go to this one. So over uh, with, with flat funding, and um, I'll talk about some of the, this is one of the ones with, where there is a notable increase in the funding that we're asking you uh, today. That, um, you know, right now, let me go to this one real quick. Right now, we, we ask, we, it's currently funded at $1.8 million annually. We're requesting an increase to $2.2 million. And quite frankly, that is really just to keep the program whole. And I know we talked about this at the work session, but we have a, there's a source of money that, uh, that the Way to Go program is hitting right now. It's a Dr. Cog source, um, and it was actually proceeds from the sale of, of the of van pools. We used to be, back in the day, we used to actually own the vans. And when, now, once we got out of that business, we had some proceeds associated with that, which they were using to, um, to help with the public education campaign and the marketing and, and, and the like. But that money is, is going away and will certainly be gone by 20, 2019 or very close, or 2020 when this new tip kicks in. So really that additional money um, is really just to make the, uh, the, uh, the program, program whole. And the other, the, so just on the screen, I was going to talk about this later, but the partnership also, we're also recommending an increase in the partnership money. They have not had an increase in several years. Right now, each, each TMA gets $80,000 annually from us. We're, we are requesting, and it's the recommendation of the TIP Policy Work Group, to increase that amount to $100,000 annually for each TMA. So the total would change annually from $560,000 to $700,000 for, for, uh, for for the aggregate, aggregate of the TMAs. So with regards to the benefits, and these are the uh, benefits we, we believe we're able to, to estimate and quantify. Um, the VMTR, the R just means reduction, so the vehicle miles travel reduction, um, the 15 results we have, we have calculated, we believe it's like 29 million um, VM, uh, vehicle miles traveled reduced, which is, as, you can, as the slide suggests, over the last five years we've had um, we were, um, we've had, we've improved the VMT reduction on an annual basis over, by 38 percent over those five years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as part of our, uh, the award that I mentioned, we're helping nearly 19,000 families as part of the school, school pool program. And we have, as you know, the, uh, one of the highest rates of teleworkers in the community. And our Bike to Work Day, which we're obviously very proud about, second largest in the country. We had 34,000 riders um, this last one this last June. And the, the last bullet there uh, speaks to the partnership and what, uh, what the estimated um, uh, uh, VMT savings is associated with the partnership is 7.6 million. So that's in addition to the 29 million that was, that's noted above. Existing regional transportation operations set aside. And uh, Greg, Greg McKinnon of our staff, he gave a presentation uh, last month or the month before last about um, we had recently done a call for projects associated with this, and I always refer to this as the hidden jewel of Dr. Cog. Um, I guess it's not much, not hidden anymore, because I keep saying it, but um, <laughs> but it is a very important program. I think it's well respected amongst your amongst our members and and your technical staff. We work very closely with with your staff to to uh, in, improve and increase the efficiency of our regional arterial system by signal coordinate, by, by coordinating the signals and timing those to the best of our ability to make the flow of traffic from point A to point B as, as uh, efficient as possible. So it's a great program. It's been around a long, long time and we, we've also been able to show some significant benefits through the years. Any community that has had a project, you would have received that we do these signal briefs that kind of shows the individual benefits of that project itself. And I hope you will agree that the, the, just the travel time saving alone on every project that we've done has been significant. Um, we, I know we just worked one in Lone Tree, one in Lone Tree in, in um, Douglas County and maybe even a little bit of Arapahoe County. It's along county line. And, uh, we, we, we've, and so it was Lincoln, Lincoln Avenue, up Quebec, and I think county line. And we've showed tremendous, tremendous savings in, in travel time associated with that. And I hope. 
uh, and I hope, Council Member, you're, you're seeing the results in Lone Tree. <laughs> Last but not least is our air quality improvements set aside. Um, and this is broken down into a couple of various areas. One is related to technology. Um, you know, it's really, this is monies that we, we, we set aside for, for the Regional Air Quality Council. They are the ones that administer this program. Um, the first is the advanced fleet technology. And this is, again, this is money that they pass through to, to you all, to our local communities, for, um, um, uh, to purchase, you know, electric vehicle technology, for diesel retrofits, uh, idling reduction equipment, all those kind of things. And the other part of their program is um, their public education campaign, or public awareness campaign. Their new slogan this year, is anyone here from BRAC? I think it, Ken is, it is new this year, right Ken? It's sim simple steps, better air. That's their, that's their, their messaging this year. And um, uh, they've had that public awareness campaign as do every other regional, regional um, or every other region in the country. Um, to, to just explain the benefits of, uh, you know, uh, of carpooling and, and uh, choosing alternate modes, particularly on ozone alert days. Um, they also have used this monies that we set aside for them for SIP modeling. Um, SIP is, it refers to the state implementation plan. We're required by federal law to have a plan in place because, as you probably know, we have some air quality problems in this region, most notably o ozone, and we just completed a new SIP um, uh, for for one of one of the standards for for ozone, and um, they they use this money to uh, to help in the modeling endeavor endeavor to uh, to assist in the in the creation and formation of the of the SIP. So with regards to the benefits of this program, uh, I think it's very easily stated. You can see it on the screen. Um, Eighty plus vehicle fleets were have been awarded through 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 their their program. Um, 62 electric vehicles, 30, 370 charging station, 2040 heavy medium duty alternate fuel vehicles, and so on and so on. It's a very impressive program. They do a tremendous job, and uh, and we're very happy to have them. Um, and also, their public education campaign has been is highly respected. Um, they 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 do what they can with regards to you know they buy media, but they also use that to leverage earned media and the like as well. So. Um, we have several members of the board that sit on the Regional Air Quality Council, including myself and the chairman, and Shakti, and Elise Jones. I don't know, this, that, that might be it. There might be one more. Um, so you know, we're, so we're, we're in contact with RAC all the time on their programs, and they do a great job in presenting this information to us. So that was real quick about what the existing set-asides are. Um, some of the benefits to that program. So what you have on the screen right now is, is the existing set of size as in our current tip. Um, this next slide kind of shows you um, what we're proposing for, for the new tip beginning in 2020. So I, I just want to point this out before we go any further that all the programs that are in the existing, all the set of size that are in the existing tip are, are, um, are, in, are proposed to be in the new tip. We've just kind of, we've reclassified them to some degree to, because it just made better sense. And I will give you an example. Like, for example, the, the way we had these two, we had these two categories in the current, current tip, for one for TDM and one for way to go. Well, they're really both TDM services. So we, we kind of group those and put those under, under, um, under one umbrella, for example. Um, but you will see, and I'll just click on this, and I know this is hard to see, but it just it further, ex I hope illustrates that the programs themselves, while they may be in different categories and areas, are, um, are, curse, are they are covered under the under the uh, under the new proposed headings. Like for example, the regional TDM partner, TMA partnerships are now part of TDM services. The traditional marketing projects in TDM are now covered under a broader category called TDM projects. Uh, small infrastructure projects, which were part of the TDM, are now covered under community mobility planning and implementation set aside. Um, but I will, uh, with all that said, I would like to point uh, to your attention within the agenda memo itself, table, table one, which highlights the new proposal and the, um, the cost or the proposed um, uh, funding federal funding that would be associated with each of those programs. Um, there are some notable changes from the last one that I would like to draw your attention to. Um, the first is um, 
well, I've already mentioned this, like the, um, we've created this community mobility planning implementation set aside and that would combine the existing stamp and UC program with the TDM set aside and we are increasing that amount from 1.6 in the current to 2.8. Um, there's the two big changes are the next two bullets on, on the first page of your agenda and that is the regional traffic operations program um, would have a, would, we would place greater emphasis on the emerging and advancing technologies in this program and it's proposed to increase that set aside from from uh, 16.8 million to 20 million so 3.2 million dollar increase because as we all know and you know we've talked quite a bit about the mobility choice initiative we have ongoing we know that there's there's a uh, tremendous push in the area of technology and we just want to be prepared for it so we want to set additional monies in this in this pool to be able to um, to accommodate the growth in that area and um, uh, and I've al already mentioned the way to go program our proposal is to increase that by uh, by four hundred thousand dollars annually so that would be a total of uh, from seven point two million over the four years to eight point eight and again that's just make the program whole Last but not least, we are suggesting a new, um, new set-aside. Uh, it's called Human Service Transportation Set-Aside. And really the purpose of this is to provide dedicated funding source to, provide, to improve service and mobility options for our vulnerable populations, particularly seniors, um, uh, seniors low-income individuals, uh, veterans, and the like. Uh, this, we had a pretty good discussion about this at the, at the, uh, tip, at the uh, work session. Uh, we feel very strongly about this. We know that, particularly in the, uh, and Jayla can speak to this better than most, that whenever we do surveys and whenever we talk to people, one of the one top two items are always transportation. Seniors have always had a difficult time, time getting, getting transportation. So this money would be used um, uh, for both services and the possibility of using it for the purchase of additional vehicles because you know as, as as demand increases and we are the third third large third fastest growing aging population in the country this state is that we're going to have a need for um, for uh, rubber tire stock as well so we, we would we would suggest that services and and rolling stock would be um, would be included in this effort and we would work with our existing transportation service providers uh, to to uh, to allocate this money out to them so it's a uh, uh, I would, I would really, f we feel very strongly about this one, and uh, we would um, um, appreciate your support on this. So, with that, I'll just, I'll be quiet for a few minutes. I'm sure you have questions. I'll be happy to try to answer them. So I'll just comment real quick that the uh, Mr. Rex mentioned at the beginning of his presentation that um, this was discussed at our previous work session, and and at uh, this board's. Uh, direction staff went back and went into a lot more deep dive of the details so personally I want to thank staff and, and Mr. X for all the effort and work that they put into this to give us the detail that uh, we asked for thank you. so um, in the queue right now I have director Atchison and then director Cernanic director Atchison thank you sir but to follow up with your comment I think that one of the things that we have seen both Iraq has continued to deal with the air quality piece that we have here in the state We've seen the increase, as uh, Doug mentioned, and Jayla will beat on us if we don't all get on board with her. She might beat on us anyway. Yeah, she might anyway. <laughs> but I think we're all seeing it within all of our communities, the demand for, for transportation for our, our seniors. Many more of them are not able to drive any longer, but they still need to get the doctor's appointments, the stores, to events where they can try to stay active and stay healthy. And based on that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the proposed set aside for incorporation to the 2020-2023 TIP policy document. Second and a comment. We have a motion and a second, Director Srinanik. Yes, well, there may be other comments, but um, <laughs> in uh, taking a look at this, uh, definitely in support of this, but I would ask uh, Mr. Um, uh, Rex to um, Take it a step further as far as the staff work is concerned, uh, knowing that uh, there's going to be asking for greater accountability with regard to our federal dollars is to, um, not necessarily for the purposes of tonight's vote, but actually have performance measures and objectives and a way that there would be a follow-on to those 
uh, so that we'd have something in the quantifiable sense, uh, knowing there's a lot in the qualitative sense, but also move it into the quantitative sense uh, so that we know what um, is, is happening relative to these areas. Did, uh, did Director Dyack just channel through you or? I'm, I'm just. No, uh, we're, we're just simpatico. <laughs> All right, in, in, in the queue, I have Director Shaw and then Director Partridge. Director Shaw. Thank you. And I would really just add on to what you said, Director Cernanek. Um I believe uh, metrics, something like uh, the example of, of uh, Lincoln to Quebec, if we were to say something like uh, it measured at 15 minutes and was reduced to seven minutes, um, and, you know, 10,000 cars a day travel that track, to me that's something that I could present and feel good about, um, more quantifiable than, than qualitative. Thank you. Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Executive Director Rex, I think it's been mentioned by our staff in your meetings you, that even though this is going from 40 to 50 million debt, it, it's a starter. It kind of gets the ball rolling on tip, and I think that's a very good thing to look at. Even though I do, a, you know, little challenge every time you increase that that, that amount. I uh, certainly have some concerns with that, but I think with what we will look at, we'll do a very good job bringing that to us. I think another thing we need to look at is these programs really bring back local control. That's what they all are. They are really more local control. And with that, less onerous processes to go through. And so really we are able to get the funds to our citizens as we, that's what we're tasked to do, no doubt. And the other part is I like this because local control, and as former Representative Libby Zabo knows, what we all <laughs> preach to our state legislators, the local control is where it brings back. But I think this really f helps us focus on the regional, some regional approach that we're looking at. And I would say this leans more to sub-regional control because all five of these programs really look at it. It's sub-regional that really provides the most for these programs to really be effective. So that's really why I think it, it benefits us from a sub-regional approach to certainly look at a, a high percentage on sub-regional. I apologize, Director Josal. Thank you. My just absolutely That's okay. mind <laughs> blank. Raise my flag. My mind blank. <laughs> and I apologize uh, if this was answered at the work session that I missed last a couple of weeks ago, but I see that the regional transportation operations technology is the largest amount of set asides at 20 million. Correct. And it's the only one that says approximately one fourth, or about five million, I would assume is for staff and consultant expense. Right. So why does this one talk about the cost of staff? None of the rest do. And then also we're assuming then that the remainder of the 15 million is all for projects that you've described as examples. Right. Um, very good question. I, I don't know if I can answer your first one very well. Uh, but I will say that the, the money that's associated with the staffing of this regional traffic operations one, um, that is, it, a lot of that is consultant services as well. Like we, you know, when we, because you know, we only have so many staff resources. We only have so many staff members. That if the, um, you know, if there's time that we, we need need additional support that we do provide uh, consulting services to to your staff in order to time those signals and the like. Um, yeah, we just wanted to be upfront about that. Um, now, I, the only other the other program that's probably that has uh, you know significant staff associated with is our way to go program. I don't know, Steve. Steve, real quick, if you want to hop up on the mic, if you might want to uh, just mention how much staff is included in that set aside. Yeah, and I'll and I'll say too, we did present um, actual budget numbers at the uh, TIP working group session. So I mean, ballpark numbers of that 1.8 million, about a million of that is staff. And remember here, at uh, Dr. Cog in the way to go program. We manage all of the, the regional efforts, so guaranteed ride home, van pool, carpool matching, um, even administration of all the partnership uh, aspects. But it's, it's about half of that amount is, is staff here for the Way to Go program. 
I'll just add one thing on that uh, regional transportation operations. Um, just to reemphasize something that Mr. Rex has said a couple of different times, that this is probably one of the most regional things we do here. Yeah. This is probably one of the things that affects the region more than almost any other thing we do as far as getting our folks from one end of town to the other with the technology that's available to us. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Other questions or comments? We have a motion. Oh. Mr. Chairman. Don't, don't, don't scratch your head. No. <laughs> If, if, if Mr. I may, X. real quick, I just wanted to answer, and I, the, the comments that we have with regards to performance management and monitoring these projects, and as the chairman suggested, that was, that was something that we talked about in the executive committee as well. Um, you know, there are federal requirements with regards to this now, and we're very conscious of being, we have to report and monitor this stuff, and actually within the TIP there's something specifically related to CMAQ that we're required to report uh, on the progress of. So, um, yes, I think going forth, you're going to see a lot more efforts in that respect to, to, for us to, to show, show that monitoring and, and hopefully success. And also, if I may, the other RAC member I forgot to mention is Mayor, Mayor Herb Atchison. I didn't see him over the monitor. He's easily for, forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Overlooked. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, with no further comment, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, we're moving on to informational briefings. So uh, agenda item 11, which is attachment B, presentation on Denver's Vision Zero Action Plan. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. Um, we're, ver we're honored here this evening to have Rachel, Rachel Bronson from uh, City, uh, uh, City County of Denver staff to present to us today. She was, she's the, been the point of contact for, for Denver's uh, Vision Zero program. They've just finished their action plan, um, and I, I think they're obviously very proud of it. And I, uh, we, we've served on a committee, uh, Matthew Helfand of our staff served on a committee to help in, um, in guiding this endeavor. Um, the reason we felt it was important for you all to see this presentation this evening, um, you may recall in the U Unified Planning Work Program, or as Director Dyack refers to it as the UPWOOP, um, we, we are, we are um, planning on doing a regional Vision Zero effort. Um, maybe as early as next year and um, so we thought it'd be important for you guys to see because we'll probably be using a lot of this as a template um, and, and we are just so you know um, uh, we are Dr. Cog is planning on pledging our support to to the city uh, and county of Denver's plan as at least as it relates to the initiatives and the actions that Dr. Cogger mentioned in such as public education and the like so I just wanted to point that out as well Rachel please thank you director Rex um, good evening. Uh, this is my first Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting, so it's an honor to be in front of you this evening. Um, as as uh, Mr. Rex said, I am a transportation planner of the City and County of Denver Public Works Department, and I'm really excited to present our Vision Zero action plan to you all this evening. So Vision Zero is a principle that Mayor Hancock um, announced the city's commitment to in February of 2016. It's a vision of zero fatalities on our streets. Um, in, in Denver, it's all about a data-driven, transparent, and multi-agency approach. An important foundation of Vision Zero, we recognize that people will make mistakes and that we need to build a transportation system that minimizes the consequences of those errors. We don't see a vision of a utopia where error doesn't happen. We just don't believe that people should die or be fatally injured as a consequence of error. An important foundation of our Vision Zero approach is also a focus on equity. So I, in the next couple slides I'm going to talk about data and why Vision Zero is needed, particularly in Denver. A foundation of, of Vision Zero is that deaths are unacceptable and preventable on our streets. In Colorado, motor vehicle crashes account for more than twice the number of deaths as homicides. Last year, over 600 people died traveling on the streets in Colorado. Over 40,000 people died traveling nationally. That's, that's about the size of the, of the Littleton community um, dying in one year. Traffic deaths have risen, risen over time, particularly in Denver. So this chart you see here is 10 years of, of fatalities from traveling on our streets. Um, you can see the trend line shows an, an increase in that. In Denver, our crash rate is much higher than many of our peer cities. 
When compared to a motorist, pedestrians are 30 times more likely to die in a crash. Motorcyclists are 13 times more likely to die in a crash, and bicyclists are six and a half more times likely to die in a crash. So we start to see in the data an overrepresentation in what we, we, we call vulnerable roadway users, um, bicyclists, pedestrians, and motorists. That point is taken a little bit farther when you look at Denver's commute mode share compared to traffic deaths. So a little over 7% of people bike and walk and travel by motorcycle, but those um, modes represent far more than half of the deaths on our streets. And this data is from 2016. Commute mode share and um, data from DPD. In Denver, some behavioral and contextual issues. So seatbelts were not used in nearly one third of motor vehicle fatalities. In over half of motorcyclist fatalities, the rider was not wearing a helmet. And we see a prevalence of very poor behavior, failure to yield, careless and reckless driving, impairment, hit and runs. Contextually, many of our fatal crashes occur at mid-block locations. The majority of pedestrian and bicycle fatalities occur in unlit conditions. And a point that I'll, I'll talk about in just a bit is that 50% of our fatalities happen on 5% of our street network. So a little bit of how we got here. So um, as Mr. Rex was saying, we've been drafting our Vision Zero Action Plan. We really appreciate Matthew's participation on the Technical Advisory Committee, which is, a, is comprised of a couple dozen different agencies and city partners that have come together to create our action plan to, to address this significant issue. So we spent the first few months in this data analysis and, and best practice review period um, we looked at similar Vision Zero plans, happy to share those with all of our peer cities. Um, there are a lot of really great plans out there and we pulled from a lot of those in developing our plan. Um, we looked at proven countermeasures, that's a really important part of our data-driven process. We really are interested in what's going to move the needle and what's proven to move the needle and not what we think may move the needle. And then we're focusing on city policies and where we have policy gaps and where we can, where we can address those moving forward. I mentioned our technical advisory committee in, in um, we first formed, we had our first meeting about a year ago. In January of this year, we broke into three topical areas, our working group meetings, where we talked about speed and street design, impairment, and what we call safety culture, which is the education and encouragement aspects of, of safety on our streets. And we had a number of stakeholder and one-on-one -on -one meetings. Finally, on our, our public uh, involvement side, we conducted an online map. Um, which I'll talk about in, in intercept surveys and we reach thousands of Denver residents. So through our intercept surveys we were located at um, four locations which are on our high injury network and in communities of concern, vulnerable communities across the city. We received nearly 200 responses, 200 responses and heard that the largest concerns were speeding, distracted driving and crossing times for pedestrians and the top wish for a city action was to build safe streets for everyone. This is a photo of our Vision Zero Coalition members. The coalition is a, is a coalition of organizations across the city, nonprofit, largely organizations such as Bike Denver, Bicycle Colorado, Walk Denver, Transit Alliance, um, Interneighborhood Cooperation. They've all come together to support the city in our efforts to get towards zero. This is a, a coalition member at our intercept surveys. We also did this map-based survey where we asked people to tell us where their issues are across the city and um, when they experience that issue, whether it's speeding or um, if somebody not yielding, uh, where, that, where that location was, what time of day they experienced it, and what mode they were traveling when they experienced it. And we found the biggest concerns are speeding, failure to yield, and other. So other was a large category of uh, actually quite informed and thoughtful responses that we received from folks. Our map-based survey is still online and, and you can um, find it and you can go to this map where you can actually scroll into the 2,800 responses we received and see the specifics of uh, the concerns. But what you see here is different icons represent speeding, an accessibility issue, um, failure to yield, a timing issue. So we've taken all this information, all this public involvement, um, all of our, our TAC meetings, and we've gone through this action plan development. So we took all this information and we brought our draft recommendations for the action plan to our TAC at the end of May. We received uh, comments on those, and then we, we brought back out to the community our draft action plan. 
and we just closed public comment period for that. The action plan is, is available online, so you're welcome to take a look at it. And we'll be finalizing the plan in September. So these are just the main components of the plan. Uh, we really wrote the plan to read like an executive summary, to be very approachable. We want this to be something that is a collective of all people of Denver. Um, that is, is something that someone can pick up and see where they fit into to the plan. So our call to action, the action plan is a five-year plan. Um, we are, our performance measures are really based on a five-year time frame, and our target is to eliminate traffic deaths by 2030. You know, we, we realize that's a very ambitious goal, but we also don't think that Vision 10 is acceptable, um, so, or Vision 5, or what have you. So um, our goal is zero by 2030. And um, really our call to action is someone loses their lives every six days while traveling on our streets. And we do not have to accept this as inevitable. So our actions, which I won't go into tonight, but they are grouped into five themes. And really these themes were distilled out of all the public involvement that we did in the talking to Denver residents. Those, those themes are enhanced processes and collaboration. And this is basically business as usual has not gotten us to a reduction in fatalities, so we need to do something different. Um, this is looking at city processes and processes of our partners, and also looking at policies across the city to, to get towards zero. Building safe streets and creating safe speeds are really our infrastructure and engineering um, actions. On the speed, the speed side, this is um, very critical. Speed is, uh, there, there are two factors with speed. It not only increases the likelihood of a crash happening, but it increases the likelihood of a serious injury being involved in that crash. So speed is deadly, and we have quite a few actions to address speed. Culture safety, again, is our education encouragement kind of programs. And improving data and being transparent, we, we acknowledge that we have some issues with our data, and um, we are pledging to, to work toward um, solving those issues, which will help us measure our progress towards zero and as we move through the five-year five -year action plan. An important component of our plan, as I mentioned in the beginning, is an equitable plan. So we really are focusing on avoiding actions that have unintended consequences. We've really heard this from the community that um, there are certain actions, particularly those on the enforcement side, that can um, unintentionally affect more vulnerable populations. And we are, we're very cognizant of that. And um, we, we know we have a lot of levers in front of us as we address Vision Zero. And um, we know that we can pull a different lever to avoid any unintended consequences. We are prioritizing our efforts towards communities of concern. And I'll talk about what that is in just a moment. So the communities of concern and the HIN, which I've alluded to a bit. So this is the high injury network, the HIN. This is that statistic I mentioned in the beginning. The yellow lines are about 123 miles of streets in Denver. They represent about 5% of our street network. It, approximately 50% of fatalities occur on this HIN. So if we're really interested in having an equitable use of city resources and really moving the needle, this is where our focus is, is going to be. This is the HIN then layered with the communities of concern. The communities of, of concern was a, an analysis we did. We looked at a number of different variables, such as safety, um, destinations to schools, rec centers, child adult obesity, vehicle ownership, elderly. We weighted a number of vari these variables and others and um, essentially arrived at this, which is about 30% of Denver's area, but it represents 38% of traffic deaths and 44% of pedestrian deaths. So um, the HIN, along with the communities of concern, are our focus to, um, to really have the largest impact. So I wanted to end on a positive note, and that's what we are doing. Um, in addition to developing this action plan, what we're doing and putting on the streets in Denver. So at 30th and Downing, very close to connecting neighborhoods to a light rail station, we just installed um, one of several RRFBs, so rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Uh, this, is a, this is a signal, a, a vehicle warning signal system that pedestrian pushes to um, have vehicles yield to them in the crosswalk. On Morrison Road, which is um, in the communities of concern, and parts of this is on the high injury network, We've been doing a, a good bit of work over the last few years. So we installed medians. We installed curb extensions to shorten crossing distance 
distances for pedestrians. And uh, we've been, we received a grant from CDOT a couple years ago and we're building a signal at Knox, Morris, and Alameda. 13th and Broadway, so just right out here, you can actually see the, uh, the cheater light on the signal head for, for police officers. 13th and Broadway is unfortunately a very high crash intersection for pedestrians. So over five years, there were 14 crashes at this intersection involving just pedestrians. One of those was unfortunately a fatal crash involving a young attorney last year. Um, and so we have implemented a protected arrow essentially for vehicles. Oh, oh, so 10 of those 14 crashes were all the same crash type. It's a pedestrian going eastbound or westbound as you see in this photo and a vehicle turning southbound onto Broadway. So we know what to do. <laughs> uh, we, we have the toolbox and we know what, 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 how to fix this. So um, we've installed a protected left arrow here as well as a leading pedestrian interval. So cars are held while pedestrians get a head start to cross the, cross the street. And finally, Fifth and Lincoln I wanted to showcase um, what we're doing with some temporary treatments. So it often takes some time to um, get through the contracting process to build concrete, to build sidewalks, to, to, to build curb line. So in the meantime, we're using temporary materials to get at the same purpose. So here at Fifth and Lincoln, we had one fatal crash involving motorcycle this year and one serious injury. Um, we've done a good bit to enhance signage and we've res we're restricting entrance into this additional lane here and shortening the crossing distance for pedestrians. We also just received a grant um, from CDOT last year to build a signal here and that design is underway. So with that, this is my contact information. Uh, I welcome any questions. And I didn't include our, our website that has our plan on there, but if you go to denvergov.org, if you just Google or search in the search engine Vision Zero um, or email me, I'd be happy to send it to you. Director Graves and then Director Cernanek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Rachel. Really good job. You know, this is this is a difficult and sobering conversation to have as uh, community leaders and I, I wanted to kind of step out of the statistics for a moment and step back from the technical and physical changes we're trying to make to the landscape and remind you of an incident that happened in Denver just three months ago in May there was an 11 year old boy who lost his life on East Evans right in a tragic uh, and fatal accident and so as as we assess this vision zero program and all of us around the table are trying to determine if it's too ambitious or how we really quantify the impact these changes can make. I really just wanted to remind all the directors around the table that each one of these numbers on the screen have some real life connection right to people in the communities that we serve. Someone's son or daughter or a child going to Boy Scout, somebody who doesn't come home to their families. And so if, if ever we were to lift a, a heavy mantle for something that mattered, where we can really make an impact as a regional community, it's through this Vision Zero program. So we just wanted to thank you uh, for listening to our presentation tonight. We'd like to share any materials that you find of interest and, and really invite all the members of Dr. Cog to come along with us on this journey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, in the queue, I have Director Cernanek, Director Brockett, and then Director Zarin. Uh, and I will uh, start by emphasizing what Director Graves talked about. Um, my son, when he was four, had a classmate that was killed in an accident, and it was kind of his best friend, and he still remembers that, and he's now 33, uh, so it made quite an impact on him. Um, what I also know is the gentleman that was driving the vehicle also had a four-year-old in that same class and he has been scarred forever um, in what happened. So it's sometimes not just the victims, um, but it's those that may have been driving the vehicle. Uh, and um, it was some kids doing unsafe play uh, that contributed to it. So, um, which leads to my question, Rachel. Um, knowing that most of our communities have members uh, that at some point in time drive through streets in Denver uh, and one of the items that you've spoken about is the culture of safety and um, maybe you could just take a few moments to 
Um, tell us about that and how we might contribute to spreading that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I did want to add, too, it's not just the victim and not just um, the violator, but um, in, in the case of a serious injury, it's the person that's still living with those scars the rest of their life. So um, these, these impacts really filter through our community in, in really powerful ways. So that's a great question, and I actually presented to um, the Regional Transportation Committee yesterday. So I know a number of you have heard this presentation. I appreciate you listening to the repeat. Um, we received a similar question yesterday at, the, at that meeting. And so the culture of safety is actually our largest section of action recommendations. Um, it's everything from training programs. So we're really looking to the city. You know, we have 12,000 staff in the city. We have a very significant fleet looking at our, our own education that we can do internally to the city, but also looking at our own fleet, what, what kind of technologies can we implement on our fleet to, to make these, to make our system safer. Um, I have to look back at our, we have over 70 action items, so I have to look back at the, the list to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, another kind of theme within that, it, our sub-theme within that is um, inc increasing the convenience of alternatives to driving, especially driving under the influence. So, uh, you know, working with RTD, working with our transportation network companies such as Uber and Lyft, um, and working with taxi companies to really increase those options and the incentives for those kinds of programs so people have an option rather than uh, driving under the influence. Um, we, we've, we, we're looking at even reviving some of our old programs such as taxi stand programs in downtown. Um, a large part of the culture of safety, so, so every one of our themes, we have a keystone action, so our, and that's sort of a foundational action that we really need to accomplish that we can build off of. And um, that is, is to build a multimodal safety education campaign. Um, so we've put about, a, we've looked at some peer cities, we put about a $1.5 million price tag on that. Um, but we see that as a, a multimodal, multimedia campaign that we'll develop um, working with a number of our partners. I know we've got some great resources out there that we can lean on um, in some other previous campaigns. But um, I think that's another kind of area where other communities, we can, we can work with other communities in the region to develop a campaign that maybe isn't just unique to the city and county of Denver, but is unique to the region um, and, and spread the message on the culture safety side that way. So just those are just a couple of of action items in that theme. Director Brockett. So Rachel, thank you for that presentation. And Director Graves, I really appreciate your words and placing this in the context of the human impact here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, Boulder uh, is working on some similar ideas, but we're a little further behind and we, we need some help actually. But I wanted to ask you about one issue that you raised, which was about the safe speeds. Um, because of course, if cars are driving slower, there will be many fewer fatalities, but people will get places slower and congestion will increase. And so then, and then there's community pushback. So there's, there's a tension between transportation and safety. And how are you managing that as part of this program and, and, and dealing with communities that are affected? It's a great question. And um, honestly, we, Denver is, is um, on the speed front speed management, traffic calming, we haven't done a tremendous amount of work on that historically. So this is a very new program for, for Denver. Uh, so I can't really look to any historic programs that we've done to say this is how we manage that, that conversation. Uh, I imagine a lot of those conversations are coming because uh, it's a really good point. I mean, as more people are traveling on our streets, congestion is increasing, and if we're then proposing to slow speeds down, um, that does contribute to congestion. I think the conversation comes back to the fundamental, though, of we, I mean, we know whether you look nationally or internationally that speed kills. And um, I think that, that remains the bottom line. If, if our goal, which we are saying our goal is zero by 2030, um, we really need to keep the, the human aspect, the human element, and the importance of this in mind. So um, I think a lot of it's to be determined, but I think having a very strong plan will really be something that we'll lean on to be successful. Director Zarn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for this uh, conversation and, and presentation. It's very appreciative of it. Um, I just had a couple questions. I'm sorry, I'll have a few here. But um, the first was, 
Uh, are there any actions in your action plan about uh, deploying advanced technologies uh, to make highway and tra traffic uh, safer? Yeah, we don't actually specifically call out um, advanced technologies. We so Denver has our smart city program, where we're really leaning on um, on leaning on that program to implement. And they've I'm working closely with a smart city team. They are actually using the so so while it's not being implemented under the purview, I guess, of Vision Zero, it's being implemented through through the smart city team. Um, they are using the high injury network and communities of concern to. Um, basically develop use cases as they call them, so focus areas of smart city technology to things like um, smarter pedestrian detection, so if a person in a wheelchair doesn't have enough time to get across in the three and a half feet per second that we allocate, uh, the system will acknowledge that a person is in the crosswalk and give them more time. So, so technologies like that that are safety related, um, we're definitely looking at through the smart city lens. My, my second question was uh, in your conversations, especially with uh, the public, um, what was the mood or conversation around primary seatbelt and primary seatbelt laws? Um, so the conversations, we haven't, honestly, we haven't gotten there yet on the public front. Um, when, the, when the conversation on, on seatbelt came up, it was internally within the technical advisory committee and um, our city agencies and other partners. So um, I don't have the details on that. That's okay. My last question was about, uh, you said trying to avoid uh, actions that have unintended consequences. And I was just wondering, and you said especially on the enforcement side. Mm -hmm. I just was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further on that. Yeah. So one thing we did hear from the community, particularly in communities of concern, is some areas of Denver feel that there's they're overly enforced um, and that the presence of additional enforcement for things like traffic violations, speeding, violating stop signs um, would feel like an undue burden on particular areas that already receive, so this is just one example, that already receive a, a good bit of enforcement in other areas. So in that case, we'd look to another lever to pull to get at that issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the queue, I have Director Zabel, Stolzman, and Jay. Director Zabel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Rachel, my question was more to have, did you take into consideration, um, and, and all our communities are looking at this, the amount of people that have moved into them and how the percentage of those deaths mm -hmm. that were caused? Do you know what I, what I mean? When I I'm do. That? So, like, it's rate, looking at the how the rate has changed, and yeah, the know. percentage rate, I guess, is yeah. to the you know we're absorbing a hundred thousand mm -hmm. people in the metroplex every year. Yeah. That's got to change some of those statistics. Was that looked at? Um, so, it wasn't. It wasn't. So, when when you look at like this, the high injury network, this is just crashes. So, it's actually not surprising to see many of our arterials on here because there are this has this is not normalized for rate uh, it's not normalized for for a number of people traveling on these streets um, so uh, in, in some cases throughout the plan we did but when looking at the high injury network we did not look at that so these are just raw number of crashes but it's a really good point when when we're looking at the data we want to if your crash rate is staying steady then that's a good thing because you have more people traveling on your street but uh, you know, it's it's more of a steady line. So yeah, it's good. You know, and it's bad, mm -hmm. right? Right, right? But um, is it really um, those absorbent rates? Are they really going up, or is it just staying steady with the amount of population? That would be interesting to know. Yep, and we are finding that it is going up. <laughs> yes, our crash rate is going up. Bottom Director Stolzman. Thank you very much. So I just am sort of tagging on to uh, Director Brockett's comments. Um, one thing I observed that CDOT did really well was um, notice when we need to make physical separation. So I grew up in Jefferson County, and the bicycles and pedestrians always were on Interstate 70 for a section of the highway. And so I think you know CDOT really did a great job recognizing that it's important in some cases to make physical separations, and now the bicyclists and pedestrians have a way to stay off of uh, Interstate 70 when uh, Highway 40 terminates there. So I, I think sometimes separating things is really important uh, when you can and we need to recognize as a group that's very expensive 
And that's why so many of us submitted so many bicycle pedestrian projects in the last tip cycle, because those are the expensive projects to fund. Um, it is hard to do it on your own without outside funding. And those bicycle pedestrian projects actually improve the, the street network as well, because you can keep your speeds um, where they're safe to drive if you have physical separation of the people and the bikes from those streets. So I think this kind of all ties together, and we should remember this with our funding. And I think we should try to remember this when we're updating our Metro Vision if we want to try to sync it up and try to get to the Vision Zero as well in our Metro Vision. Director Jane. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm, this this project, this uh, information is really dear to the heart of the city, my city, Wheat Ridge, um, because we did, we narrowed a street, meaning we took a lane out, and which caused a backload of uh, irate uh, citizens. It was, it was really quite a fight. But what's happened is the amount of safety that has incurred now in our street, and it's become a wonderful selling point as far as why you would want to do this. The citizens, know they've, they sort of, we've got a now a gang that saying it's, it's safer. We like it much better, and it is. It's more pedestrian friendly, more bike friendly. It's really changed the nature of our city. It's created a more walkable, desirable area. That narrowing of that street mm -hmm. slows down that traffic automatically. We adopt the speed limits. Mm -hmm. Our traffic went down, and then it's back up again. But this, the safety factor has gotten stronger. So I, I couldn't recommend it enough, but it's uh, not easy. <laughs> people, people really love their streets and love to drive on them. Uh, interesting, because we've also done the, we'll be doing the bulb outs, and we've got the flashing light, and it, it's all very helpful. Mm -hmm. So that's 38th Avenue, our, our main, uh, main street. It's also brought more development to the city because of, of the, the change in the city. Wonderful. Director Shakti. Um, I just wanted to comment. I went to Amsterdam last month, which was unsurprisingly amazing in their bicycle and infrastructure. And incidentally, no one wears a helmet ever. Um, <laughs> but um, I was Googling about how, how, why is Amsterdam different. And um, I think it was in the 80s, there was a child killed by a car whose mother became an activist and started a movement that changed their infrastructure. So it's interesting. Other questions or comments? Uh, Director Perkins Smith. Rachel, thank you. And I did see this presentation as well at, R as at RTC. And I, I guess I just wanted to kind of hit home, you know, what Denver's seeing is what we're seeing statewide. Um, both the rate and the actual number of fatalities and serious injuries continues to go up. And I think it's going to take all communities to really look at this to actually have some sort of impact. And as we get more and more people into the state, more BMT, I think it's just going to continue to um, keep, keep going. One thing I would like to respond in terms of statewide statistics, one of the things that we saw um, was that of our fatalities, I believe it was between 20 and 30 percent were um, non-seatbelt. So in terms of the fatalities, so if you just think about that, um, you know, it's like a free insurance policy in some ways if we could just make sure that many more people may have been able to go home. Director Zarin. I, I just want to, I'll add to that. Uh, 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 Director P Perkins just mentioned that not just fatalities, though, but injuries, especially that seat wearing seatbelts reduces the likelihood of serious injuries or just injuries in uh, themselves. Um, so I just wanted to continue to echo that point. Other questions or comments? So I'll make one comment slash question since it didn't come up, but it did come up at RTC yesterday. The comment slash question came up whether or not. We're talking, we're talking about driver behavior causing a lot of these incidents, um, but how many times or was it documented that it was bicycle behavior or pedestrian behavior of somebody stepping into the crosswalk while they're looking at their phone or bicyclists that go against a red light, which we see all the time. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that as well because I know it came up at yesterday's meeting. Yeah, so we actually, um, off the top of my head, I don't have the data split out looking at 
behavioral um, statistic, but when we do release the plan, our appendix will have all of the kind of modal specific um, attrib attributes to all the crashes. I'd say though that um, looking at the looking at the issue more systematically is really where our focus is. So in the event that you know a pedestrian is crossing the street illegally, what is the system not providing that that we can do to provide? So is there not enough time? Is there uh, is a signal too long? And in the case of a bicyclist, if they're running the, the, the light, is the detection system not working? So um, while I definitely think it's important to look at the educational side of it, it's also important to look at our system and make sure our system is, is operating to, for, for people of all abilities and all modes. Director Sullivan. Um, just one quick question. I'm just curious in this network, um, do you know what percentage of those streets are one-way versus two-way? And is there any difference in the accidents between the two? These are all really great questions, and I wish I knew the answers. I, um, you know, I do not know. I, off the top of my head, just kind of browsing, uh, most of these are two-way streets. Um, yeah, I mean, there are sections of Downing that are one-way, but largely they are two-way streets. But they are arterial streets, so there are four lanes or more. Um, yeah, carrying a lot of volume and a lot of speed. Yeah, and I, I ask that because with Lions, we have a, a system where we've got basically one way through town and one way coming out of town. And we've always had the debate of would people go more slowly if we actually had them two way, yeah. you know, on either side. And if there's any data out there, I'd be really interested in that. Yeah. Yeah, I th I, anecdotally, the data shows that two-way does help slow speeds, which, as a result, improves safety. All of our, well, much of our downtown is one one-way streets, and the downtown network does not pop in the HIN. So I think that um, that's a, kind of an interesting counterpoint. Uh, but downtown speeds are pretty slow because you know it is harder to move through downtown. Downtown's posted 25 miles an hour as well. So. Any other questions or comments? This is an informational item, so there's no action taken, but I'd like to thank Ms. Bronson for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. The next agenda item is agenda item 12 under attachment E, and it is uh, front range, long range transit planning. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really, I'm just going to introduce our speaker, but I wanted to give a little bit of background to this item. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Dr. Cog is represented on uh, what's known as the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Uh, this commission was created in the last legislative session, Senate Bill 153, which really took what was the previously existing Southwest Chief Commission, which was concerned with preserving and potentially expanding the Southwest Chief, Chief Amtrak service in southeastern Colorado and added to that commission's mission uh, the notion of looking at uh, the feasibility of passenger rail service along the urban front range corridor, the I-25 corridor uh, throughout the front range. Um, so the commission, we kicked off our work, uh, our first meeting was July 31st. Um, in four months, we need to produce some type of uh, legislative language uh, presented to the legislature. Um, obviously, we're not going to have a final solution to such a big problem in four months, but uh, we at least have a charge uh, through the commission of uh, producing legislation to carry the issue forward. So at our first meeting, we um, had a lot of good background information, and the presentation you're about to see uh, we thought was uh, particularly sort of helpful and thoughtful in thinking through these issues because there are no easy answers. This is a conversation about choices and trade-offs. Uh, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Krutzinger, uh, who is the Deputy Director of CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, directors all, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you tonight. I think Jacob set it up well. Really, um, for this evening, the, the question at hand is, is what would you advise the Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail Commission? So I'm going to give you a bit of history of what CDOT's been doing um, operating Bustang, the interregional bus service from Fort Collins to Colorado Springs, talk about all the rail planning that's been ongoing for five years, 
and then give you a, a brief intro on the Southwest Chief Front Range Rail Commission. All of that, uh, five years all condensed down to about 10 or 15 minutes. So. <laughs> It's the, it's the Cliff's Notes version. Um, as you see on the, on the cover slide here, we're talking about local service, interregional service, and future visions. Um, busting, very briefly, uh, we, we started the interregional bus service uh, two years ago now. Um, it followed on uh, the Front Range Express, which operated from 2007 to, I believe, 2006 to 2012. Um, and then uh, CDOT uh, assumed the, the role in, in providing that service. Our ridership year over year from the first year to the second year is up uh, over 50%. And our fare, fare box recovery, which is a measure of how much of the operating cost is paid for by people's dollars and credit cards as they come on the bus, um, has risen from 38% to 53%. As a baseline, most urban transit systems are in about the 20 to 25% fare recovery range. Focusing on uh, north and south um, and leaving the, the west corridor to the side for, for the time being, the, uh, the north route um, grew by more than 50%, slightly more than 50%, and the south route grew by closer to 40%. Um, we believe that the south route has some latent demand potential um, as in compared to the Front Range Express, the, Frex, the, the prior Frex service. We're not currently serving Castle Rock or the Denver Tech Center, so those are important things that we think could uh, raise the south route's ridership considerably. I'll just have you note very briefly the current stops on there um, because that is important to the slides that are coming up next. Um, before I turn to some more details, I just wanted to give a shout out to some of the uh, lesser known uh, legacy bus route connections. The, all the turquoise lines are routes that uh, uh, CDOT has a small slice of Federal Transit Administration money that's dedicated to maintaining inner city, the legacy inner city bus routes and maintaining those connections to rural parts of Colorado. So it's important for you all to see how that all fits together. We're rebranding that all as Bustang Outrider. Right now it's a collection of about five or six different operators and different services, each with their own websites. So almost nobody knows that it all exists. But it all feeds, much of it feeds into the Denver network. And, and connects to the, the Mustang service uh, that, we're, that we're talking about. So what, what CDOT can do in, in the short term with relatively little money compared to, say, an entire front range rail system would be to invest in park and rides. The smaller green circles are the ones that exist right now. The larger red circles are the ones that, that don't exist presently as Mustang stops. The, Longmont one in the middle is a CDOT park and ride for carpoolers and vanpoolers. That does exist, but would need some retrofitting to make that usable as a bus tank stop. Concept here and on the next slide on the south is that you would have roughly 10 mile spacing for your stops, so you maintain a very rapid um, travel time north and south, um, Fort Collins to Denver Union Station, and on the next slide, uh, Colorado Springs to Denver Union Station. Same concept here. The large blue circles are the stops that are not yet in existence, or in the case of the Denver Tech Center, um, existed at one time and the, the light rail replaced it, so we don't have a great place to, uh, to stop at the moment um, looking at, at these future connections. So that's bus. I'm going to briefly touch on three CDOT rail planning activities to give you that background of What's, what's all this about high-speed rail or computer, commuter rail, and what's all the thinking that's been done on that? And I'll thank many of your staff members. Um, over 100 uh, folks contributed to these efforts, um, staff member participation, and some of the directors here um, serving on working, working group committees and advisory committees. So first, the, the interregional connectivity study. This study was completed 2012 to 14, uh, the first part of it at a time when the uh, federal government had, had just passed the uh, Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act, PREA, and made a lot of money available, about $10 billion for across the country for high-speed rail. So there was money available if we wanted to get in line for it. This is what we had to do to um, determine whether we wanted to try to compete for some of that for Colorado. On the left side is the, is the vision network that came out of those years of study. Um, there were many alignments chosen, or many alignments looked at. 
um, east and west side of I-25, many ways of crossing through the, the Denver metro area. And then the uh, I-70 corridor, um, would that be rail, would that be maglev, what would that look like? Um, all of that together in 2013 dollars was $30 billion, 340 miles. If you ask individual f people, they say, well, gee, we should just build the train to the mountains. That would solve our congestion problems. But as you all know, with the $30 billion price, $30 billion price tag, that doesn't happen very quickly. The right side is, is the sort of moving towards a little bit more moderation in price. Um, what was the biggest bang for your buck? You could get two-thirds of the entire system ridership out of a much shorter segment and for only one-third of the cost. So for about $10 billion, you, you get that um, and you get two-thirds of the ridership of the entire system. Sounds like a great deal. It's, I would say, a technical solution, not, not politically uh, accepted by all entities, and you'll see some comments uh, going forward. So there was a brief hiatus, and then we came back in the last year to look at look more seriously at a couple of questions that had remained um, since 2014. Those questions were to take the um, original alternative on the left that was from the prior slide and look more heavily at could we leverage RTD's track in some way, some form, to save lots of money. The, the beltway um, around 470 was roughly $3 billion at the time that it was studied. So everybody said, well, just use RTD's track to save $3 billion, easy. That, that lowers the price tag, and, and there we go. As we dug into it, um, on the, the north part, it's, it's easier to make um, inner city trains work with RTD's commuter rail. They're, they're compatible technologies. They both work well with freight trains. On the southeast corridor that's shown here in the, in the center graphic, the challenges were much more daunting. You'd have to replace a lot of the stations and extend track and adjust curves and, and bridges, all engineering possibilities, but it, it would be a significant multi-year um, impact to all those riders using that. And then on the right was, okay, well, if you can't use the southeast corridor, then maybe go ahead and build the um, part of the, uh, the beltway arc of the high-speed network and connect it to the east corridor. I won't go through all the numbers on this, but I will touch on a few that, that kind of highlight the, the comparison. So in the capital expenditure, the one that says CapEx on the top column, $11.5 billion um, is the adjusted now to $2017, the price tag um, for the, the original uh, option that was from a few slides ago. If you go through Denver and use the southeast corridor from the south and the north metro line from the north, you you do save a lot of money, but you don't save $3 billion. You have to reinvest quite a bit to do all those retrofits that I mentioned. In the ridership column, 13.6 million riders per year down to 11.6 million riders per year. So you got a 16% drop in the cost, or excuse me, yeah, 16% drop in the cost and only a 15% drop in the ridership. So th those two um, alternatives, one and two, then from a benefit cost standpoint, weigh out pretty comparably. Going down to the um, one versus three, you only reduce your costs by 3%, but you lose 22% of your ridership. And so that one didn't pan out as being one that we would, that we would advance. Not to say that it couldn't be done if there were other things that, that changed our minds in the meanwhile, but the, the upshot of that was to kind of leave those two as our, as our primary um, concepts. <laughs> So key comments coming out of all of this is, uh, like the Fast Tracks program that you're all very familiar with, nobody wanted to be relegated to phase two. So the, I, I said that the, the two-thirds of the benefit um, for one-third of the cost um, was a technical benefit cost solution, but it was not politically accepted by everybody. Um, you may not have noticed, but the as it came down to Colorado Springs, it ended at a Briargate location, which is about 10, 11 miles out of their downtown area. So Colorado Springs said, well, that's, that's not exactly where we would like it to, to end. Um, additionally, there was not enough information about how the, inter, how the airports interacted. Um, is one airport stealing with, with, with rail, would one airport steal passengers from the other, or do they work better together with rail, as you see around the country, and we just have more airport uh, um, boardings and um, planements and 
inplayments and deployments. Um, third item, as you see, everybody thought we could save lots of money by leveraging RTD track. We could save a good amount of money, but I don't think as much as most people were hoping for. So uh, folks said, hey, we haven't studied the South I-25 corridor, particularly the segments between Littleton and Castle Rock. Let's look at those commuter rail segments and see if there's any opportunities there. Um, the North I-25 commuter rail study then gives us a perspective of what we might expect if we do look at the Littleton to Castle Rock segment. So this is a study that, that uh, CDOT did from 2001-ish to 2011, about a 10-year effort um, to come up with a vision for the entire North I-25 corridor. Um, lane widenings, carpool lanes, uh, park and rides, bus stations, and the brown line is the commuter rail using the uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe BNSF Railway uh, right-of-way. At the time that the study was done, the price tag was, which you can see up there, $684 million to complete the brown line and connect that with RTD's North Metro line. With inflation um, to the time the study was done uh, to $2014, went up to $819 million. And then the scope changes there mentioned are, are twofold. One, the original study at the time it was done, the working assumption was that the freight railroads were on the verge of moving about two-thirds of their freight traffic to the eastern plains. Um, things didn't pan out that way. Coal started declining a bit, and, and the railroads backed off from, from that kind of uh, optimistic scenario. So that, did, that meant that uh, passenger and freight are still sharing the same corridor. In the intervening time, there were a bunch of crashes nationally between commuter trains and freight trains. So we have positive train control. Think of it as a, you know, sort of advanced traffic control for trains, um, which increased the cost there. So now with all of that and then inflation to 2017, we're up to 1.4 to $1.6 billion to complete the Brown Line and connect it with RTD's North Metro Line. All right, so we're almost there, and we'll get to the, the, the upshot of what the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission needs to look at. So we've got different price tags here from all the work that's been done. It's easy to, for the eyeballs to trend over to the left side and go, hey, well, we'll just pick that one. It's really cheap, and we'll do that. Um, not, not all of these are created equal, as you'll see on the next slide. Not all of these serve the same number of communities. So I think that's a very important thing for this group and for the... Uh, the representatives from this group that are serving on the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission to carry forward and try to work out. So travel times. Busting right now on uh, North I-25 with those managed express lanes that have continued to be extended north can deliver you from downtown Fort Collins to downtown um, Denver in the peak hour, an hour and 25 minutes. If you get on at the Harmony uh, Park and Ride where the little kink is up at the north, it's just a little over an hour from Fort Collins to, to downtown Denver. Uh, pretty incredible travel time. In comparison, next slide over, the, that brown line and the previous slides, if you built it and you connected it to the North Metro, North Metro Rail Station, there are so many stops in between that you would be spending $1.5 billion to offer a worse travel time than what the bus stand can do today. The high price tag of the high-speed rail <laughs> delivers phenomenal travel times, but it's on the I-25 corridor. It's not over where many of the communities, particularly in the north between Fort Collins and Longmont, um, feel like their, their downtowns are best served by that kind of development opportunities. So those are all the dimensions of, of what, uh, what CDOT's been grappling with as we've led some of these studies and I think what the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission does. Last thing I'll mention is that we're finishing a state freight and passenger rail plan in early 2018. It's a FRA requirement, Federal Railroad Administration requirement. If the state, if the Denver region wants to pull down some Federal Railroad Administration money for any of the options uh, previously described or any new permutations that you all uh, would like to propose, this is our avenue to do that. Um, RTD maintains a really good relationship with the Federal Transit Administration and New Starts and knows that process well, so we're all positioning Colorado and positioning Denver as best we can to pull down whatever money we can get our hands on. Across the bottom are all the logos of the different flavors of money that have been offered through different programs, competitive and otherwise, over the last few years. 
we stacked up all of those funding sources and what those really tell us in this uh, football field diagram is that our existing funding sources only help us in the do no, do no harm category. We can do some preservation and we can do some small improvements, grade, grade crossing, safety improvements, and grade, uh, grade separations of, of freight railroads. We, none of our existing funding sources get us even to a starter rail or even uh, get us to a commuter rail or high-speed rail concepts that would run all day long. So enter Southwest Chief Front Range Rail Commission. Um, this helps elevate, I think, the discussion to a, a new political level. We have plenty of technical information, but we need some, we need some good political discussion going on. As Jacob mentioned, this commission has two functions. Um, one is to continue to preserve and rehabilitate the existing track, keep that Southwest Chief service passing through Colorado on its journey between Chicago and Los Angeles and many points in between. So keep that economic uh, driver, that tourism driver uh, going through Colorado. The second one is to take all of the information that I've given you in the rest of this presentation, try to make some more sense of it and help uh, chart a path forward. The draft legislation due by December 1st doesn't need to be anything huge. It doesn't have to be, uh, hey, we're going we're gonna to pass a giant tax. It could just be some advice to the legislature on what's, what's, what's needed. Opportunities and challenges, I think, are pretty um, self-stating. Our, our growth is uh, faster than, than our, uh, some of our lane miles and infrastructure can, can keep up with. Our transit use is growing. Our current millennial boom in the population is giving us a great surge in, in supporting flexible travel and options. The little for now part is, uh, is just an acknowledgement that as all these uh, millennials like previous generations as they grow in and have children of their own, uh, do they continue to choose travel in the, in the same way. Challenges, our funding is not keeping up with our population growth. Fixed transit is expensive and agreeing on implementation strategies hard. Um, so do we go for incremental? Do we just keep extending RTD's network a little bit at a time? Do we go for a whole quarter thing? So I'll offer California and Utah as two different examples. California did the, okay, let's pass a statewide thing and go big for giant money. Um, Utah did the, uh, well, let's, we'll, we'll build the commuter rail and then we've got plans over time to straighten out some of the curves and get it to be faster and faster over time. Um, the second one there about growing bus into rail is maybe we just invest in the uh, park and rides heavily now that are along the I-25 corridor and then those become the service points for future rail. Hmm. Next steps, finish, finish some studies, keep us in the, uh, the waiting line, if you will, with the state rail plan, keep us eligible for money. CDOT's completing a South I-25 planning environmental linkage study, which is helping to define the monument to Castle Rock or a monument to uh, C-470, uh, E-470 segment um, and what that vision should be. And we're including some of the rail and some of these discussions in that. CDOT will continue to do a walk before you can run strategy with Bustang unless and until there's more political and financial support. And then we all together are trying to seek that balance of travel time for customers, price point um, that you'd have to charge the users and the construction costs that, uh, that we can all stomach politically. Um, and that's what defines how we go forward. Thank you for your time. I'll turn it to the chair and questions as, as time allows. Thank you, Mr. Kretzinger. Questions or comments? Really? <laughs> all righty. Uh, this is an informational brief. Oh. <laughs> Director Shakti. I just want to say thank you. That was very cool and interesting. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. This is an informational item only, so there's no action to be taken. Thank you again, Mr. Kretzinger, for your presentation. And next we have agenda item 13, committee reports. So we will go down the list. A is uh, Stack, Director Jones. So at the last meeting, we got an update on the Colorado Transit Network by David. Um, and that's the precursor to the state transit plan that's going to be updated in 2018. We heard about the new infrastructure for rebuilding grant program called INFRA, which will replace the um, Fastlane program. 
Uh, we attempted to discuss long-range revenue projections for 2045, which is always an interesting exercise. And then we spent a lot of time talking about Senate Bill 267 and CDOT's strategy around trying to predict whether or not the legislature will actually cough up $100 million for their portion of the debt repayment and what would be cut if they didn't. And I think the, the general consensus is from the STAC, Transportation Commission, and CDOT is that move with caution, lower expectations, and don't plan out very many years because of the uncertainty around that program. Is that about right? I thought that excellent. <laughs> and that's my report. Thank you. Metro Mayors, Director Atchison. I think we were a little bit more optimistic. We were pretty sure the state would not fund CDOT. <laughs> In fact, we challenged them to come up with anything. Uh, other than that, uh, we do have some continuing conversation on RTAs that are going on around the metro area, and that will continue. We have a caucus coming up in a few weeks, and uh, other than that, I'll leave it alone. Thank you. Uh, area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. We are still in summer vacation, so we didn't even discuss the summer, the uh, state legislature. Very good. Mm -hmm. Item D, Advisory Committee on Aging, Director Cernanek. Yes, uh, we did not have a July meeting, but do want to put a reminder out there for folks. On Saturday afternoons from 4 to 4.30, I know that many of you are not very busy, and you would just love to listen to a live radio show uh, hosted by our own Jayla Sanchez, um, Warren, and uh, that is on AM 1430. If you have a hard time finding time on a Saturday afternoons, uh, you can catch most of the shows. Uh, they're included on the website. So if you go to nocopayradio.com, uh, you can actually look them up. And if anyone is interested in a particular show, uh, July 16 of 2016, uh, there was a board member that was interviewed on the show. <laughs> Who would that be? So I'm guessing it was a really long interview. <laughs> <laughs> Item E, RAC, Director Shakti. We didn't meet. Very good. Uh, E470 is Director Rakowski. Director Shaw? Thank you. Uh, we were have been talking to Conoco about some service plazas along E-470, and Conoco uh, uh, informed everyone that uh, they were going to uh, let that part of their business be sold to 7-Eleven. So <laughs> service plazas along E-470 uh, will likely be provided by 7-Eleven. They're also looking at uh, less less expensive uh, ways to examine the images. And there are a number of things they've been looking at. Uh, they're uh, going to be trying um, uh, Colorado Correctional Institute viewing of certain types of, of images not associated with uh, owner, vehicle owner information. So it should be a cost savings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fast Tracks, Director Van Meter. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want? We're having cross discussion. Director Park. Also, also at E470, when they were created by the state legislature, the authority part of the funding mechanism for E470 was a highway expansion fee, one and a half miles on either side of it, for uh, commercial or residential. Ability permits that fee has been eliminated by unanimous decision by the board. Great. Yeah. All right. Fast tracks, Director Van Meter. Thank you. Just one item to highlight, and that is an interrelated set of budget challenges that staff and the board are working through at RTD right now. And when I say interrelated, on the fast tracks side of the six-year annual program evaluation budget plan process. We reported to our board, staff reported to our board earlier this month, August 8th, 
that there is about an $85 million gap in revenues to expenditures to complete the capital and operate the system over that six-year plan. So we are working to close that gap. This is a multi-month process to develop the six-year plan for, for finan financial plan and budget for fast tracks. $85 million gap earlier this month was reported to our board. On the base system side, that's everything that's not fast tracks. The strategic budget plan, which is also a six-year plan, is currently showing a gap of about 160 million dollars, at least as of August 8th. Uh, these were the third drafts that staff have prepared and presented to our board. We anticipate in the September or October time frame being able to bring a balanced budget, six-year budget plan to our board, but uh, I wanted to let everyone know that that's the current status of our base system and fast tracks budgets. And on the base system side, that includes a deferral of about $400 million of identified needs over that time period, capital needs um, that if they aren't addressed over a period of time will lead the system to start have, having deferred maintenance challenges and issues. So it's pretty sobering. It's a lot better than it was when we first unveiled these numbers to our board of directors. We have confidence, of course, that we will get to a balanced budget, but it's going to be painful. And um, I'm not pulling any punches. That's the low light or highlight of um, board discussions this month and in the past couple months and coming up. All righty. Informational items, I'll point out the items 14, 15, and 16 are there for your information. Administrative items, our next meeting is September 20th. Um, I have one item real quick under other matters. <clears throat> In the last couple of weeks, I don't know why it happened this way, but it did. I was asked to do a presentation on who Dr. Cog is to both the Aurora Association of Realtors and also the Aurora Rotary Club. And I just wanted to mention it only because uh, Dr. Cog has a really nice, concise front and back single sheet that explains what we do here at this board table and what Dr. Cog is. And uh, Doug got that for me, and it was really handy to be able to have his handouts and be able to use for a presentation. So if you do something in your community where you have an opportunity to present Dr. Cog, it's a great little tool to use. Other items by members? Director Graves. Something fast and fun, Mr. Chairman. By show. Whoops. Thank you. By show of hands, who here has eaten at Firehouse Subs? Their brisket is to die for if you haven't had it. That's the first thing is I'm hungry at the end of the meeting. I also found out this week that they have a foundation and Federal Heights and Thornton received money to buy equipment for their fire departments, uh, which is really great. So I just want to make sure that for all of you that have uh, fire departments or are part of fire districts that may need additional funding, for key equipment, jaws of life, different things, firehouse subs has a foundation. So eat up. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is Director G Graves is buying at eight <laughs> eight forty p.m. <laughs> Director Perkins Smith. I just like to do a public announcement, um, a public service announcement. So uh, as we know, the total eclipse is coming. Uh, although Wyoming and Nebraska are the areas of focus, uh, we have been in discussion with those other states. And um, the biggest um, traffic jam we think will occur coming back, so on Monday and Tuesday, just so that you're aware, we have ta undertaken measures on certain roadways to actually suspend construction uh, starting Friday night through Tuesday and also major maintenance activities. So um, I just, and we've also set up an incident command center as well to um, I don't know how much we can do, but I just wanted people to be aware that we have been trying to do something. Director Brockett. So, Director Perkins Smith, um, are you going to make the interstates one way on those? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in reverse flow? That's probably not a bad idea. Uh, other matters by members. At 834, we are adjourned.